Welcome back to Refit and Sale. My name's George Ist of the Solent Boat Butler. This is a Contessa 32 from the mid 70s. It's Project Lottie again, and this is the chart table area that I have just kind of refinished and rebuilt partially to make it look all beautiful for the owner. And in this video, I'm going to talk about how I did it. Due to time constraints in my day job, I don't get a chance to video absolutely everything I do in all the gory details. So sometimes I just make little videos like this just to talk about what I've done in a particular area of, of the boat. And if you follow my uh, Instagram, then you may have seen some pictures of this area whilst it was being done. But quite a few people have asked about how I've gone about just beautifying and making this area look um, nice and tidy and smart for the owner. So I'm making a video all about that. So keep watching and uh, we'll talk about the different elements of what I've done here, what I've modified, what I've kept, what I've just refreshed, and we can take it from there. So starting with this area here, the bulkhead front, the top of the chart table in there, it was all covered in some pretty awful wood effect formica. Now, I don't know if you know what formica is. If you're English, you probably do. It's kind of like a, a hard laminate material that is glued down on top of the plywood base here. And um, it looked very, very fake and looked very, very 1970s. Now, I know some people do like to keep the kind of the 1960s, 1970s look to these boats, whether it's the galley worktops or the, um, the other worktops in the boat. But um, this particular owner, and I kind of agree with him, wanted to ditch the horrible formica and put in some nice new real wood on all of this area. So um, the first thing I had to do was chip off all the horrible old formica that was all around here. Now if you've ever done that you'll know how ridiculously razor sharp that stuff is when it splinters and cracks. So um, there were a few little nicks and bits and pieces on my hands when I took all that off but um, it chiseled off fairly quickly um, and cleanly. It didn't do any damage to the underlying plywood. Now that made it very easy to come in and re-veneer or re-coat all these surfaces with a new um, material. But before I did that, I took the old worktop off because um, the worktop that is on this chart table, and uh, sorry, I've got a chart here as a prop so that you can see it's a chart table. So I thought I'd bring one of the charts off my boat. This is of the British Virgin Islands. Put that down there. So. Um, before I started recovering everything, the first thing I wanted to do was to build a new uh, desktop for the chart table. Now the old one had a simple lid that was one piece and all contestors originally came like this and it's a bit of a silly design because what happens when you open a one piece lid is you can kind of get it to there and you can look in but it doesn't make getting into the chart table very easy because you have to hold it open or you have to kind of have some sort of thing to hold it open because it hits against there so you can't open it all the way. So one of the common mods that I have done and what the new contestors actually have as well is a bifold lid. So the new lid goes like that and so you can just prop it up and then you can get in really easily and then there's no restriction to be able to see what's in there and you can reach to the back and sides and see everything that is in your chart table. So. That was the first uh, big mod that I had planned. Um, but what I had to do first was obviously remove the old desktop, which required me to remove this fiddle here very carefully because I wanted to reuse it. And I had to remove this fiddle here, which was somewhat easier because it was just held in with a few screws. Um, this was glued and screwed and with very gentle teasing and prying and a minor bit of tapping and hammering, I was able to get it out in one piece and there's very, very minor damage to it. So it was able to go straight back in. The reason I wanted to keep this and reuse this is because this wood is original to the boat and it matches this wood, it matches the capping, and I'm just trying to blend the old stuff with the new stuff. And the more of the original wood that I can reuse, the better um, is the way I feel about it. And where I have had to put in new wood, it's very clearly new wood, but so some of the trim pieces that I've put back in kind of around here, I've used um, uh, a wood which is a very close kind of ready brown close colour match to the original stuff here. So this is actually Sapili trim that I've used uh, around the edges. I think this is a very red teak. Um, I don't think it's mahogany. It almost looks like mahogany, but I think it is actually teak, but it's a very, very red teak. So um, I, I don't know quite why it is as red as it is, but um, it sounds and it smells like teak. So um, I'm pretty sure it is. It's just a very red one. Um, but anyway, 
lid off, I was able to take that back to the workshop, I was able to cut out a new blank and then bring that blank back in and then refit that on the original table. So the sides here are all kind of um, original as, uh, as it was from the factory back in the 70s. So with that made, I was able to then come in, plan where I want this lid, um, come in, buy some piano hinges, and cut this up. Now, one of the key things I also wanted to do is, and you may not be able to see it very well on camera, is there is some quite nice grain in this um, teak veneered plywood. And uh, I wanted, with the hinges in place, to make sure that the grain still matched in terms of its location. So there was a bit of careful trimming and thought put into how I um, cut the slots needed to put the hinges in because I needed to make sure I removed the, rem removed the material in the correct place so that when this all screws back together the, um, uh, the grain in the wood matches between the lids and the piece around the outside. And that was um, not difficult but it did require a little bit of thought and a little bit of care. The other thing I had to do was just notch out these hinges slightly because um, Underneath this lid there's obviously um, some supporting structure for the lid to sit down on and uh, to uh, make it all fit with these hinges I just did have to notch out these um, hinges slightly so it all goes down. So these are stainless steel hinges, just piano hinges um, and uh, you can buy them in kind of long strips and just chop it down to the size you want and uh, screw it on. This is slightly rickety at the moment but that's because I've only got about eight of the 35 or 40 screws that are needed to actually hold this all in place but I've just put this together this morning so that I can show you kind of the finished product even though I've actually got to take this off again um, just to um, kind of get it out of the way and just help me do some other works in the area. So that is the desktop. Um, up in here this also had that horrible formica on it so that all got stripped. Uh, same here, this has got the horrible formica on it, what I've used here, and again it's not very clear but I'll try and take some close-ups in a minute and, and edit them in. Um, this is kind of like a V-grooved uh, plywood headlining material that I've used elsewhere in the boat. I've used it in the back of the bookshelves which are over there, which are kind of out of shot, but again I'll take a video if I remember. Um, so that's just been stuck on the original kind of lining material there. Um, this um, piece here is uh, not just veneer, it's veneer on a backing of very very thin plywood so it's about three mil thick and um, gluing up veneer on a thin plywood is much much easier than just gluing up veneer. If you saw my previous video I did the re-veneering in the heads and I didn't really have enough space certainly on one of the bulkheads to use this thin plywood with veneer on it because the sliding door was running in and out and I didn't want to alter the mounting points for the sliding door and so I just used plain veneer. But this stuff's much e much, much easier to use. I will um, go and get an example of it actually and uh, carry on filming in just a tick. So I've just nipped downstairs to the pile of um, offcuts and bits and pieces that's under the boat but here is the thin kind of plywood with the veneer on it is wet because it's been raining outside but you can see it's about two and a half three mil thick and it has this lovely kind of veneer on it which is somewhat water stained now because it's been out in the open um, but uh, you can just cut that out so size I templated it first with um, some cardboard or some paper uh, took it off to the workshop carefully cut it out brought it back it was slightly oversized so I can just trim it down very slightly and just get it all to nice and neatly fit into um, this area here and I use the same material on the back face of here uh, and I've already talked about the headlining there and the stuff on the top was just plain veneer um, but I was able to take this piece of headlining down and do it on a, a flat surface and get it glued down and then screw that back up so that's all done. So um, with that back in place with the lid back on the top, I was able to reinstate this um, fiddle on the side, having kind of stripped it and uh, made it ready to have some varnish put on it once it's back uh, on the boat. Um, you can see there's a few um, little plugged screw holes there. Previously, this was just literally glued on, um, but I didn't like the idea of that because you want this to be reasonably secure because when you walk down through the boat, it's quite often used as a handhold before you get to the handhold that's up here. So um, just uh, chuck three screws in there in addition to the glue. Um, it's notched into this post here. So again, it can't pull out sideways there. So that's why I didn't put screws all the way along, just some screws at the end here and it's notched out there. So that's gonna be plenty strong enough. It lasted the last 50 years with it just being 
kind of glued in place with a few little um, tacks to hold it whilst the glue sets. So I think that's going to be more than uh, strong enough for hopefully the next 50 years as well. So the next thing I had to think about was uh, what was going on with this switch panel. Now these are Blue Sea Systems panels and I've just put them in to kind of show you what it looks like. Uh, and I'm just gonna just pop this out gently. Uh, so what I did, and you may have seen it in an earlier video, is I removed this whole panel here, this wooden piece. Um, it's bonded in to the hull at the bottom uh, and it tucks up underneath the headlining at the top here. Uh, while we're talking about headlining, there's a whole load of cracks and nasty stuff going on here. So I've done a bit of a repair there, which hasn't been totally finished, but um, it's finished enough for now because I wanted to get this in. So in this area, I was able to take the old piece out back to the workshop, use it as a template to, um, to cut out what I needed to go back in here. Uh, and then pop it back in. I've had to fit it back in two pieces because this was fitted before the deck got put onto the boat. Um, I had to cut it in half effectively to take it out and I've put it back in in two pieces. So if I scroll down a little bit, you may see just here there is a piece uh, going across here. It's just like a trim piece that is covering the join between the top part of this panel and the bottom part of this panel. Now the bottom part of the panel has been glassed back in to the hull. It needs to be glassed back in because it effectively extends this stringer. So there's a stringer that comes along the hull here. I'm hoping you can see that without me in the way. Uh, that stringer stops just there and then the kind of continuation of that stringer is actually the bottom end of this um, Piece of furniture. So that has all been glassed back in to maintain the strength that um, the hull needs in terms of its structure to resist the flex. Um, and then the top piece is just decorative, it's just there to house the um, switch panels. Now fitting these switch panels was a bit of a faff if I'm honest. I'm just going to see if I can get the camera sorted. You can see it's kind of all kind of notched in and notched out and what have you and it's the same here. This is the 240 volt distribution, again, Blue Sea Systems. Um, there is not a lot of space between the edges of the um, breakers and the edge of the panel, particularly there. I mean, there's about five mil there. And so if I had just cut out a square, I potentially would have cut out the material that I need to screw it into. So um, you can see they're all a slightly unusual shape in terms of how I've had to notch things in and notch things out. And that's purely so that I've got enough material there to screw the panel in. Now, what I would have actually liked to have done is to have a hinged door here so you could open it up with the panel on it and it would have made um, me fitting it much, much easier, um, but it would have made future modifications to the wiring system slightly easier as well. But because of the panel that had been pre-bought for the boat, we've got one that is three sets of switches wide, and not quite so um, kind of long, if that makes sense. Um, and there just wasn't, I felt, enough space to make an opening with all the framing and everything like that and have the hinges and everything and have the panel quite high up. The only way I could do it would be to have the switch panel down here, um, which would have then meant I'd have to put other things elsewhere. And I went through a huge number of iterations with bits of cardboard on this panel to try and work out how to make it fit nicely so that I could put in a swing out door, but it just wasn't going to be um, feasible or possible without um, having to relocate some of the other stuff that we also wanted to have here. So um, as in life, everything is a slight compromise. So haven't got a swing out door, but um, hopefully because we're putting all new systems into this boat, there should be very, very little work that needs to happen on the electrical side after it leaves me, fingers crossed. Um, so this has all been cut out. We're gonna have the main uh, 12 volt distribution panel in here. Uh, this space here is going to have the master switch for the batteries for the engine and the domestic batteries. Um, this panel here is for the Yanmar diesel engine because it's got an internal um, on off switch and the 240 I've already mentioned goes in there. Now one of the things I've think, been thinking about in terms of future proofing is um, at some point this boat may get a new engine so I have very specifically left lots of space around the Yanmar engine panel because most modern engines have much, much larger panels and I wanted the ability to potentially just open up that hole so that 
as and when the owner wants or needs to replace this engine. There's no reason to think he needs to in the immediate future, but you know, it's a 15, 20 year old engine. Um, if he wants to put in a new Yanmar or a new Beta or a new Volvo, what have you, all their panels are slightly bigger. So I've left enough space around here and I'm not going to mount anything else in this area um, so that when it comes to doing an engine swap at some point, two, three, five, ten years down the line, we can just open that up, chuck a bigger panel in and away you go. But what I have done is I've left enough space above some of the other panels to fit some of the other equipment that's definitely going to be going in. So one of the items that is definitely going to be going in as part of the electrical install and it's something that I always recommend to anyone who has a boat is a decent battery monitor. So this is a Victron BMV 712 which I have fitted. I've lost count of the number of things that I fitted. I have got one on my own boat as well. Uh, I'm just going to see if I can pull it out. It's quite a small little uh, round gauge and uh, there we go, just this little chap here. You can also attach to it via Bluetooth so you don't actually need this. You could hide this somewhere completely out of the way, but um, I think it's quite nice to have it on show. So um, I've got the gray one, so it matches the gray panels. There is a black version as well, but um, the gray one can go up there. The other thing that we're thinking about fitting in the longer term, but not immediately, is to fit some heating on this boat. So um, there's also gonna be enough space for the heating control panel to go up there as well. But there's an awful lot of stuff going in this area um, and there is limited real estate on any boat, particularly a Contessa. Um, so we have had to um, have a lot of back and, back and forth with the owner in terms of how, where and when we're going to be fitting certain things and where we're going to put them on the boat and, and that sort of stuff. But it's quite nice to kind of consult on these things rather than just get on and do it because then the owner knows he's getting exactly what he wants um, uh, and you know a decent amount of thought has been put into it. If you are very keen-eyed, what you may have noticed was there's an awful lot of cables kind of just dangling down here. And one of the jobs I've got to do, and I've kind of partially started, is to go through all these cables. A lot of these are for lighting. Some of them are historic. I've removed all the stuff that I know I definitely, definitely won't be reusing. But some of this stuff, unfortunately, I've got to reuse. So the lighting cables that go through the headline, you simply cannot replace them on these boats without dismantling the deck or dismantling the headlining. So um, some of these cables I'm gonna be reusing. What I need to do is go and buzz test all of the lighting cables to work out which ones are for which lights because some of the lighting cables I'm using, some of them I'm gonna reroute and put new cables in. Um, and then everything else kind of just needs labeling up and I'm gonna to have to make the most of it. And then uh, there's gonna be a whole bunch of new stuff going in here for all the electronics. Um, and basically anything that's new and accessible is going to get new cables run to it. And I've already run some of those new cables. So um, here's one here, which again, I haven't got round to labeling yet, but I've just fitted as part of um, the works I've been doing recently, some courtesy lights up inside the bookshelves. So touching on the 240 volt side again, obviously I've got the master 240 volt panel here with the master breaker. Um, there's further three switches. They will be used for the a battery charger, which is this thing here. So I've bought a uh, Victron battery charger, which is gonna be going in to charge the batteries which are under my bottom. They are some AGMs uh, from Rolls which have been fitted. I'll show you that in a minute because I don't think I've covered that yet on the um, channel. Um, uh, I have got uh, two further breakers, so one will be for the um, switches, the 240 volt switches that are going to go um, through the boat so he can run 240 volt stuff when he is plugged in. And then there's going to be a spare one which may at some point in the future get used for a calorifier if the engine is swapped out and we go for a, um, a newer engine which is plumbed into a chlorophyll which will also potentially have an electric um, heating element in it as well. I've already fitted the shore power um, connector outside so I use uh, shore power inlets from a company called Ratio. Um, they are really really nice um, units. Uh, they are better than some of the other more common units that are around. Um, it's a slightly more modern design and I've run the cable from from the back of the boat where it comes in through the cockpit um, up to here. The cable is effectively double insulated already because the uh, the cores of the cable have their own insulation and then there's a further insulation around that and regs require uh, cables to be 
double insulated, but I've put a third piece of insulation around it, a, a conduit um, around it, which the cable runs through just because one, it looks nicer. And two, I see no harm in having a bit of extra um, coverage on that, um, on that cable as it comes through the boat up at the top of the quarter berth. As with all boat shore power connections, it's sensible to fit a galvanic isolator and I've tucked one of those right up here out of the way. So the first thing that the cable goes through on the way into the boat is the, um, the earth um, goes through a galvanic isolator that just helps stop any stray currents that are in the circuit coming from uh, the land or the pontoon, um, causing galvanic issues with anything that is connected to the earth side, um, any sort of bonding um, of uh, things on the boat like the engine or seacocks, although I'm not actually going to be bonding the seacocks on this boat. Um, so always good to have a galvanic isolator and then that comes into this switch and then it's going to go off around the boat doing its various things. Now I am lying on the floor because I wanted to show you one further really useful mod that I've done to this boat. I've done it to early Contessas to make them closer to the slightly later Contessa arrangement. Um, here's the side of the chart table and there's a opening door here to get into a locker. Now as these boats were built originally up until I'm going to say about 76, 77, um, this locker here extended all the way up the hull um, and Basically, half of the locker was completely unusable because of the shape of the um, the hull. It was sloping. You could get stuff in the front of the locker, but putting stuff in the back or reaching anything that was in the back um, was really, really difficult. So I guess you could stuff long things in there, but it just wasn't a particularly practical thing to do. Now, on the later boats, they had this much shallower locker arrangement at the front, and then they accessed the um, back of this locker from behind and under the chart table. So I've kind of replicated that. Um, I know one of my viewers will be watching and going, I recognise exactly what you've done there, George, because you did it on my boat. Um, hello, John. Um, <laughs> so I've um, basically blocked this off. Uh, I put a piece of plywood in here, which is in almost the same place as this piece of furniture here. Um, so that's uh, just been glued and screwed, basically. There's no bonding needed in here. It is just to block off this. I have also pre-drilled the holes in here because I know that I'm going to have to run some cables through here because they're going to come out of the electric panel down there and then they're going to run forward for things like the um, lighting um, up on the mast and other cables, data cables and what have you. So I have pre-cut holes and then this has all been painted out and made to look nice and now I'll show you what I've done around the back. I'm holding the camera now so you don't have to see my ugly face in the way, but uh, there is the front of the locker. And if we go round the back here, and I'm hoping I can tilt the camera up a bit, you'll see there used to be a completely solid bulkhead in there. And um, that bulkhead simply doesn't exist on the slightly later Contessas, so I could have completely chopped it out and I think structurally it would have been fine. However, as it's there, I see no reason to completely chop it out. I have left it in there and what I've done is I've cut the bulkhead out and I've just cut it just above the tabbing that held it all in place all the way around. Uh, I put a circular saw through the three corners and effectively I've cut out kind of a triangle shape and you can now reach through that and you have a usable locker where things you're going to put in there aren't going to disappear all the way down to the bottom and actually because it's such a nice tucked away place Whilst it's difficult to access um, in terms of fitting things, it is quite a good place to fit certain electrical items that you might not need to get access to very often. So on a number of contessas where I've fitted autopilots, I have fitted um, some of the equipment for the pilots, the sort of um, the, the, the um, built-in stuff tucked right up there out of the way. So, um, so that's quite a, a good spot for it and that may be what I end up doing on this boat as well. When I was talking about the batteries and the switch panels, I mentioned that the batteries all been fitted under here, and I can't remember if I showed you that in a previous video, so I'll show you that now. Under this locker seat, so that's as far as I can get it to go down on my gimbal, um, under here you will find the batteries. So these are a pair of Rolls AGMs. They are, off the top of my head, about 115, 120 amp hour each. Uh, and because they're AGMs, you can actually use a full 50% of each of those batteries without um, running them down. Tucked in here. Um, so I built all this enclosure 
um, out of plywood and glass and then glassed into the hull. Um, there's another enclosure box back here which is full of other bits and pieces at the moment but uh, in their slots a further AGM battery, a very small high powered one purely for starting the engine. So you've got your engine start there, you've got your domestics there. At some point I've got to wire this all up and put some fuses in and run the cables up to the master switch which is going to be in the main panel which is just out of shot. Um, uh, but that is a nice, neat, tidy solution. I've done kind of similar arrangements to this on a number of boats and it works really well. In terms of battery capacity, that's always a difficult thing to get right and you have to have a conversation with the owner about what their intended plans are for the boat. But um, for most boats of this size, you kind of want to be looking at having a capacity in this kind of area, I would say. Um, so in total, there's, let's call it, um, if they're 120 each, you've got 240 um, amp hours of um, battery capacity here. If you can use that at 50% then you've actually got 120 usable without damaging anything. Um, and that is good, I think, in a boat of this size for most people and most people's uses. Um, if you're going a bit further offshore, if you're planning long periods uh, at anchor, then having three batteries or having some larger batteries in here might be a good idea. But um, for the time being, this is gonna suit the owner very, very nicely. And with both the 240 volt charging, uh, with the engine charging, which may be doing something special with that um, yet to be discussed, um, then they'll be able to, we'll be able to keep these um, topped up reasonably quickly, reasonably efficiently. We haven't talked about solar or wind um, options on this boat. I think that's out of scope at the moment, but again, those are options if you're looking to spend longer periods away from um, marinas and what have you where you can plug in. So there we have it guys and girls. I hope you enjoyed that video. I'm sorry it wasn't any actual doing in this, but quite a few people have asked me off the back of the Instagram pictures that I've put on, what I'm doing, how I'm doing it and what have you. So hopefully that explains it a little bit. If you have a Contessa or a similar boat and you're wanting to do a refurb, you know, you may want to do something similar. Um, if nothing else, hopefully I've given you some stuff to think about. Um, Thanks very much for watching. If you want to support the show, there is a link down in the description where you can buy me a beer or more if you wish. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please hit the subscribe button. Please hit the like button as well. It really massively helps me grow this channel. It pushes my videos out to you and other people that are like you in terms of how Google sees your profile. Uh, remember, if you're not paying for it, you are the product you are being advertised to, but you also have a profile within um, Google and YouTube where they see what's of videos you like and what sort of things you give a thumbs up to and then they push more content out to you which is kind of similar so it helps you it helps me just press that like button now do it now it's down there go on press it thank you very much and uh, i will see you next time bye for now